Judgment Day, we just stood in the ring at the start of Raw, and Damien Priest welcomed us to the show. Wasn't that nice? Also, hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Ups and Downs, the show that never stops, because wrestling never stops. And don't forget, one day I'm going to be dead. And do you know what will continue to roll on? It will be sports entertainment. It's a terror, terrifying thought. Let's up those downs for Montag Night Raw. Rhea then also reminded us that the Judgment Day do run Monday Night Raw. <laughs> she loves saying that. When Finn Balor continued the song, because he was like, I'm going to be the next World Heavyweight Champion. And given what was going to happen on this episode, I kind of think we have to pull the trigger and do it. The best part was Dominic Mysterio wasn't here yet. So these guys were like, <laughs> look at this video we've made, which was basically celebrating the fact that the Dom Dom had become the North American champion. I was like, man, they must really like this guy. Look at the effort on the screen. He got booed out of the place when he finally walked down the aisle. And he was like, well, I've made another video. And this one is focused predominantly on me. So now at least we know what the Judgment Day do do in their spare time. They just edit videos. Somebody was always going to interrupt because it was the opening promo for Raw. And imagine a world where that didn't happen. Actually makes me feel a bit oogly boogly. We'd all be dead. You also imagine the Judgment Day would have just spoken forever, which would have been interesting. But it was Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. <laughs> and I'll tell you, they got a mega reaction. There's also sad news with this, as we were going to find out later, because apparently Kevin Owens does have properly injured ribs, so he's going to be out for a while. So all the positive thoughts to that guy. And given what he said here, I tell you, he is slowly but surely becoming all time for me. He makes me laugh every week. Because he was so mad that Dominic Mysterio wasn't listening to him. Because last week he said, look, nobody wants to hear you talk. And yet, look, here is the condom back again. And he just won't shut up and listen to the fans. Nobody wants to hear it. Tom was having none of it because he is now a champion. And Sami Zayn took over and was like, look, I know you feel disrespected. But that's because you're a giant goober and you deserve to be disrespected. He also thought the two should have a match and that the title should be on the line. And even though Dominic didn't seem into this, this is when Rhea was like, yeah, he does accept and he's going to whip your ass. So I suppose if we ever do break those two up, which we shouldn't do, well, that can be the planting of some seeds. I tell you, though, I just love seeing all these guys in such a prominent position and they basically are running raw and it should be the way. This also set up the show and it was good. Keep doing weird things with your hands up. When we made sure we continued on with all our builds to SummerSlam because it was Becky Lynch versus Zoe Stark. Now, when we did do the most recent AEW collision ups and downs, which you can go watch right now, we mentioned that when it comes to Barry Barricade, if there is one person in All Elite Wrestling who deserves the finger of blame being pointed at them, it's Brody King. Well, if we now turn to WWE, do you know who public enemy number two is? Becky Lynch. Because at one point she just grabbed Stark and she threw her into Baz over and over and over again. And she absolutely loves doing this to the point, pull it down, the Justice for Barry counter goes up to 89, which means we are only 11 away from his funeral. And if Bex and Brody have their way, we'll be doing this next week. As Trish Stratus was at ringside and wanted Becky to lose, at one point she headbutted her with her face mask on. And I was just shouting at the referee here, why are you so bad at your job? Do you not watch the show? You must have known what was going to happen. It was pretty good though, because Zoe went for her 360 finisher, but that's when Becky reversed it into an exploder. I was like, man, this is getting good. Zoe was then able to reverse a disarmor attempt into a bomb of power, and that was really cool. When all of a sudden, Stratus just threw her face mask in the ring. And this totally distracted the official. I was melting down. Eventually, Lynch went to deal with it because she understands. And she basically got rid of Trish Stratus, which is when Zoe Stark went for a flying nothing. Now, she really should have had a plan, but she went straight into the manhandle slam. One, two, three, Becky Lynch wins. No Trish Stratus tattoo for her. And now they will have a fight at the hottest event of the summer. So once again, I just thought this was a good match and Zoe Stark is getting better and better and better. And we know Becky is right up there. Therefore, it is getting it up. Which is when Cody Rose was here. There ain't nothing wrong with that. As he is facing Brock Lesnar, he spoke up about what a dominant beast he is. Because look, he's a former UFC champion. He's a former world champion in wrestling. And even when he wasn't a football player, he was able to get on a pro football team. Rhodes also said that sometimes he's called Mr. SummerSlam. Hang on, let me, let me just check that. Nope, no one's ever said it. He then talked about the fact that even though his mother was live on Raw last week, she wasn't impressed with what Brock did at all. And if I were to guess, I would imagine that Cody Rhodes sat down, he watched that show and was like, Mum, 
You're not reacting to this at all. Because he is a damn wrestling savant, though, I think he then did tie in by going, of course she wasn't interested in you. She saw Terry Funk throw a fireball into Dusty Rhodes' face. So in comparison, you're nothing. Nobody spat. This is why Cody is the man, because he ties everything in as he made it very clear that Mummy Rhodes knows that Brock Lesnar makes mistakes and Cody Rhodes knows that Brock Lesnar has made a mistake, which is why at the pay-per-view premium live event, he's not just going to beat him, he's going to embarrass him. I like to think he's going to come out with a clown outfit and just put it on Brock. <laughs> that would be embarrassing. He also needs to do this for him, for his career, and it's because what Brock deserves when he looked right into the camera and said, at SummerSlam, this ends. Oodle Now, the best part is I assume Cody Rhodes is going to win, but is he? I'm not 100% sure. And there are some crazy rumors out there, which I won't tell you because I don't want to spoil it. I don't really know how I feel about those, but in terms of being pumped up, this got me large. Give me it up. Jackie Redmond was then with Ricochet, who was waiting for Logan Paul to turn up. Oh, that's a little bit weird. Now, he was mad that Logan was late because it just goes to show he's a YouTube star that's arrogant. I was like, Rick, come here. 90% of people on the WWE roster are late to their shows every single week. I don't think it ties into YouTube. I mean, the truth is, if you do get into pro wrestling, all of a sudden your tardiness increases by 10. When all of a sudden I realized, wait a minute, that Nikki Cross Candice DeRay storyline, which used to be involved in every single backstage segment, even if it was in the background, that's totally vanished. I also had no clues. There's only one person I could turn to. Detective Angle, storyline investigator. I'd been assigned to many a drop narrative over the years, but this case with Nikki Cross and Candice LeRae had me stumped. Was Cross still secretly stalking her? Was LeRae still telling her this wasn't cool? We don't know because WWE just stopped telling us. It's time to crack this controversy wide open. I am Detective Angle's Storyline Investigator. And then the internet melted down. <laughs> I love a good internet meltdown. For it was Sami Zayn versus Dominic Mysterio for the North American title. <laughs> That's right, Sami lost. Because <laughs> of course he did. Now Sami still got a dive in there, the official sponsor of 2023 Wrestling. And even though Rhea Ripley was casting distraction early on, Sam was just like, I'm not bothered with that. And he continued to wick the condom's ass. Sadly, there was just too many people in the judgment day, so the referee didn't know what to do. Which is when Damian Priest tried to get involved. Kevin Owens wasn't into that, so he stopped Damo. But the official then saw KO and said, you've got to go to the back. But then he saw Rhea and Priest celebrating. He said, right, I know what's gone here. You need to go to the back as well. And I was like, why didn't you do this at the start of the thing? Referees have to start watching Raw. From nowhere, Zayn also hit the Mishinoko driver for a good near fall. Where he followed it up with the least devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the Blue Thunderbomb. And did it work? Of course not. Mysterio came back with a 619, but that also didn't work, so he went from the frog splash, but Sami Zayn got his knees up. He hit an exploder. This is when he was ready to hit the Aluva kick when I smelt shenanigans. Because for no reason whatsoever, Ripley, Priest, and Owens were just back on the aisleway, and they were kicking the crap out of KO so much. Sammy Zayn couldn't handle it. Because you know the deal with wrestlers. If anything goes on outside the squared circle, they forget they're in a match. They just kind of get drawn to it like a magnet. Of course, Dom Dom saw this and he hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. And he got the one, two, three. And I tell you, this is actually his finishing move now. I think it is the greatest thing ever. Also, bring it down, counter goes up by one. Now, I really did enjoy this, and I love how much people hate Dominic. Plus, it was a pretty good match, and it helped the Judgment Day. So I am going to give it an up. But yes, this was a silly, silly finish that made Sami Zayn look so dumb. Like, I get that he was worried about his friend. But given that we were going to do the exact same thing in around about five minutes... Well, it's getting it out. Now, of course, Zayn was worried about his buddy, so he went to check on him afterwards. And we had a little skit with the trainer earlier. And yes, Kevin Owens, I do believe, is legit injured. So once again, positive Pete thoughts to him. We then got this badass video for all the Bloodline stuff, which continues to break ratings records, which is absolutely incredible. When we saw Shinsuke Nakamura in the back, and Ricochet walked up to him and said, Oh, hey, Shin. Have you seen Logan Paul? And I was like, no wonder Nakamura's pissed off with everyone. What's you bothering him with this for? Nakamura said he hadn't, so Rick was like, well, keep an eye out. And I was like, man, Shinsuke, you should punch him right in the face. This is when he turned around and Tommaso Ciampa was there. He was also getting in Nakamura's face. He was like, oh, I didn't like what you did to me last week, so don't you dare get involved in my match. I was like, Tommaso, if you just hadn't have said anything, he probably wouldn't have bothered. 
This is all on you. Which is when Dominic was back after this. It's all over, Raw. <laughs> Tremendous. He was just so happy that he had whooped Sami Zayn's ass when all of a sudden, of all the people, Apollo Crews and Tazawa were here and they were like, well, we don't think you're being very nice about it. So where did this come from? So I suppose they're friends with Sam or something. And as soon as Rhea Ripley turned to Tazawa like, oh, what are you going to do about it? He ran off. But Apollo Crews wanted some kind of a match, which is when Damian Priest was here and we set that up for later. I mean, this was truly, truly bizarre. The best part, though, is then Tazawa walked back in. He was like, ah, uh, good luck, pal. We should do more with Tazawa. Before that, though, we did have Tommaso Ciampa versus Bronson Reed. This was excellent stuff. And we were playing up the fact that Bronson is massive because at one point he was in a sleeper hold and he just squished Ciampa. And I tell you, I looked at it and went, well, he's definitely dead. He also went through a big old power charge when Ciampa just kneed him right in the face. And I was like, yes, here we go. We then cut to the commercial break. And when we came back, Bronson was just in control. So as ever, we're just going to have to make it up. So I presume Reed shouted at Champa. <laughs> I've just heard your best friend Johnny Gargano is never going to come back to the show, which does seem to be the case because he too has disappeared. And then Champa was like, well, I miss my buddy. So Bronson hit him. That works. We also let Champa do that whole thing. We got hit with a clothesline, but he just popped right back up where he hit Bronson Reed with an air raid crash and everybody went crazy. Now look, Bronson did kick out two. That was a brilliant spot. Shock Horror Nakamura then arrived. <laughs> You already know what Chumper did. His spidey senses started tingling. He was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's somebody outside the ring. I know what I should do. Look at them. So I just love this. It's just the best wrestling trope ever. Because somebody in the crowd could be beating up their Auntie Joe. And they'd be like, I don't care about that. But if they clock eyes with another wrestler, I'm frozen in time. This naturally allowed Bronson Reed to hit the tsunami and get the one, two, three. And like we said last week, all we've done here is substituted out Ricochet and we put Tommaso Ciampa into the mix. But at the moment, it's actually ticking along very nicely. And they're having such good matches. Getting it up. Given though, as already mentioned, it's the second time we did do it on the show and it makes wrestlers look so dumb. We got to give it a down. This is the brand new, oh no, I'm not looking, surprise roll up. Although that is what Dominic did. It's just learn, for goodness sake, learn. Yes, if you're a professional wrestler, <laughs> other professional wrestlers are definitely going to walk out because they love interrupting people. It's basically an epidemic. That's a down. I mean, even Corey Graves was like, oh, Tommaso Ciampa, you idiot. Not very good. Myron Saxton was then with Liv Morgan, and Liv was all like, Oh, I have such bad news. Raquel Rodriguez hurt her knee. She ain't gonna be here for a while. Morgan's plan for the evening, though, was to confront Rhea Ripley, and she even blamed the nightmare for the reason she lost her tag team championship. I was like, ah, pff, What sore loser? Liv did also remind us she was the last person to beat Rhea, which I thought was a good line, when she was like, Maybe I'll get beat up. <laughs> Or maybe I won't. I was like, man, you need a better approach than that. This is when Chelsea Green and Sonya Deville walked in. They're like, Byron, why aren't you interviewing us? We are the brand new tag team champions. And they kind of started to insult Rhea Ripley when Ripley turned up. They were like, ah, Rhea, we were just saying how great you are. God tell you, I love Sonya Deville and Chelsea Green as a team. Rhea was so pissed, she said she was going to go out there and finish Liv Morgan off, much like she had done to Rodriguez. And a small part of me was like, Morgan, you have totally brought this on yourself. And yep. She then got killed. Now, it was billed as a non-title match, but it didn't happen because when Liv was making her entrance, Rhea Ripley jumped her, and I tell you, this was an absolute massacre. I mean, she threw her into Barry Barricade, which kind of upsets me. Bring it down, it rolls up to 90. When she got a chair, and she totally pilmanized her arm. Honestly, Liv Morgan was basically crying here. It's very effective. Ripley then just continued to wreck her as officials were like, would you stop for goodness sake? And this actually also ties into real life because apparently Liv Morgan is injured for real as well and she's going to be away for a while too. And that makes me a sad panda. So once again, more positive thoughts. Hope she's okay. It ended with Rhea saying, that's what happens when you get in my business and nobody cares about you. And honestly, this 2023 is the year of Rhea Ripley. She just comes across as so damn legit and is another contender to just give all the titles to. I wouldn't complain at all. Very effective this was. Give it up. When the Alpha Academy were here and they made me laugh. They're very good at this. Because they were having a chat when Chad Gable lost it and was like, man, I don't even know what a Viking rules match was. How was I meant to prepare for it? And I was like, Chad, nobody did. Still turn around is fair play, so he now wanted an Alpha Academy rules match. And for the love of everything, give that to me. But this is when Maxine Dupree interrupted and she was like, no, I want to take on you, Valhalla, because I think I have your number. So I do believe we're going to do that match next week. And I tell you, in terms of under the radar storylines, this is one of the best WWE 
done for a long ass time. It's fun. It also finished with Otis just shouting, oh yeah. <laughs> That's why I really like these guys. It's kind of a strange thing to do. We have more SummerSlam sorting after this, which does make sense. It's happening in like two weeks. Now they get with Ricochet in the ring saying that nobody wanted Logan Paul to be here. And even though he is quite a talented cat, he hadn't paid his dues. And also, he's just a little bit of an asshole. He also called him a massive prick, so there goes TV PG. And because he has annoyed him so much, he wants to challenge him to a match at SummerSlam. Now, I can only imagine that Logan Paul was on the Starstruck Enterprise, because all of a sudden he teleported in here, he tried to attack Ricochet, and the whole time he was filming it on his phone. But because he is so arrogant, Ricochet then gave him a super kick and hit him with a shooting star press. And we got to see all of this from the angle of the camera. I tell you, it looked pretty damn cool just because it's different. Now, Logan Paul did come across like an idiot here because he had successfully attacked Ricochet when he was like, ha ha, I'm going to make one of these videos. I mean, that is like trying to kill someone. But before you do it, oh, I better order some takeout. They then stared at each other. So now you know it is super duper serious. And of course, this match will go down. But I want to warn you again. It's like the fifth warning I've given you. I'm pretty sure that Logan Paul is going to win this match at SummerSlam. And that's why we're putting Ricochet in there. I still think they're totally going to smash it because they have good chemistry. But just prepare yourself like you're a cake. This was very effective too. I'm giving it up. But then I had more interviews after this. Shayna Baszler was here. I see you're sick and tired of hearing Ronda Rousey's name, which was a little bit of a silly thing to say because she had to say Ronda Rousey's name, even though she's sick of it. The point is though, come the pay-per-view premium live event, she does want to have a fight and she wants to finish Ronda off for good. I definitely think we could make this some kind of stipulation match too. Maybe make it an MMA contest or something. When Logan Paul was also here, he's like, did you see what just happened to me? That was very unprofessional. I mean, he did make a good point because how dare you fight someone on a fighting show where he said he shall be on Raw next week, where he's going to pop Ricochet's bald head. Now listen, Logan Paul, I've told you a few times, I can see your hairline, pal, and you're still quite young. You give it 10, 15 years, and you see what happens on top. And then you're going to say, oh, I want to be in the bald brotherhood, and we've already made up your minds, you're denied, you're barred, stop taking the mick out of bald people. And then I just got confused. We did give Apollo Crews his first match on Raw since 1937, and I just can't figure out why we called him up from NXT. He was doing fine down there, and I was like, okay, that's why he's got a reprieve. But he lost to Damian Priest in about three minutes. Basically a big old squash match. I mean, you could have had anybody fill this role. So I think probably we should put Apollo Crews back on NXT. I'm not saying he has to be world champion or anything. But he can have banger matches with everyone. Anyway, he did get hit with a big old choke slam. One, two, three. And I am going to give it an up just because, you know, Damian Priest winning is no bad thing. I want him to be the world champion. But this was just jobbing out Apollo Crews when there was no need. I like Apollo, he has never got his due in WWE. That makes me a sad panda. It's getting it down. We then had a quick interview with Becky Lynch who told us that she will beat Trish Stratus at SummerSlam. When we cut to Valhalla, she was all like, oh, I'm spooky wooky. But Maxine Dupree, I accept your challenge. I mean, she even called doing this foolish. What a word. But I totally forgot we had even more that we had to prepare for SummerSlam because it was intercontinental title time. Oodalally. So Gunther did arrive with Imperium when Drew McIntyre followed. And the Scottish Warrior was like, look, I did watch Raw last week. I have eyes and I have ears. And surprise, surprise, you started making all your challenges when I wasn't on the show. <laughs> I think you're a big old coward. As McIntyre is here now, though, and I was like, thanks for clarifying, Drew. We should do it right here, right now. I tell you, I'm going to have to start a counter for right here, right now. That must be the most odd phrase in all of professional wrestling. Gunther thought this was a huge mistake, though, and basically laughed it off. I was like, have you seen the Intercontinental title? I have brought so much prestige back to this belt, which he has done. And you think I'm going to defend it in front of these idiots? Boo, boo. Well, I ain't going to do it. So he didn't. This felt very much like when I go home to see my parents and he was like, McIntyre, also know why you have a connection with the audience because you're a massive failure and so are they. You failed at Clash of the Castle, you failed at WrestleMania and you're going to fail at SummerSlam. So you, my friend, are one big fat old ass. I mean, talk about booting a man in the metaphorical groin, although McIntyre did have a good comeback because he was like, I only lost at WrestleMania because me and Sheamus got into it and then you picked the bones. At first I was like, that just makes the ring general sound like a really smart guy. And to be fair to Drew, he totally agreed. The point is now when they do get to SummerSlam, it's going to be one on one. So he will become the new Intercontinental Champion. When Ludwig Kaiser totally lost it and he got in Drew's face, he was like, 
I don't think you should disrespect my dad. Drew then stirs Shib up by saying, actually, Ludwig, I quite like you, and you should be the leader of Imperium. And I can only assume Kaiser has no ambition, because he got mad about this too, and said that must remain with Gunther. They also challenge each other right into a match that happened straight away, as Corey Graves started to do amazing Imperium impressions on commentary, but they just kicked each other's ass. That's really, really good. Ludwig even threw Drew into re the ring post when McIntyre came back with white noise. And if you went quiet, you could hear Seamus getting really mad about this. And when he went for the Claymore, Ludwig Kaiser reversed it and he booted Drew in the head instead. McIntyre was then doing his belly to belly suplexes and neck breakers because he hate necks when eventually he did get up, he got the Claymore and he hit the one, two, three. And it took all of eight seconds for Imperium to jump him, because of course they did. This is when his new buddy Matt Riddle ran out with the worst plan ever, because what was he going to do here? It was three on one, and surprise, surprise, he got hit with the bomb of power. It's like Riddle, that is one of the least successful things I've ever seen in my life. Gunther was then also going to hit the bomb of power onto Drew McIntyre and the announce table, but of course McIntyre reversed it. He hit the power bomb, he stood tall. And if I were to guess, I actually think Gunther will win at SummerSlam, but that's okay. They will have a terrific match, and it also means that Gunther can beat the record. I like this feud a lot. You can just get into it. Get it up. We then just had the most bizarre chat with Ronda Rousey. I will do my best. Because Jackie Redmond asked Ronda about Shayna's challenge from earlier, and she said, well, we can't have a fight, because when I'm involved, it's the fight. I'm sorry, go. Because hello, my friends, my name is Simon Miller, and welcome to another episode of Nobody Talks Like That. This week featuring Ronda Rousey. Because if you aren't going to have a fight, it is going to be a fight, and you can't say that you're the fight. Otherwise, any time two people had a fight, you would have to be involved. I mean, this honestly made no sense. It was two plus two equals potato. And you want to know why? Because nobody talks like that. The point is, Ronda has accepted, I think, this wasn't English. It also meant that this week's Raw was going to end with an angle. I don't think we've done that in a while. But it was a big old contract signing between Finn Balor and Seth Rollins. And I tell you, these two are doing a fantastic job. I'm totally plugged in. This always seems to happen with a wrestler who has been around for a while as well. But all of a sudden, Finn has totally found himself on the main roster. And he has so much momentum right now, as I've already said. I kind of think he should win the title. He was here first and said that there is no Adam Pearce because he's sorting out all the injury situations in the back. But him and Seth will be able to handle this like men. I was like, <laughs> this is definitely a trap. But Seth Rollins then arrived to the walls as the fans did this throughout this segment. I tell you, in a couple of years, we're going to look back at this and say, <laughs> it's the brand new what. Although actually when Finn Balor was talking, the fans were also doing the what. We're all totally doomed. Seth signed the deal straight away when he was like, oh, Finn, I see you're being hesitant there. And that's because you know you can't beat me. And also you can't win anyway. Because let's say somehow you did score the one, two, three. Damien Priest is going to cash in your ass. You're going to lose that world championship. And the judgment day is going to be over. So yeah, sucks to be you. Because again, Balor is just a man right now. He reminded Seth Rollins that the judgment day run raw right now. <laughs> Must have had that planned. Because as soon as he said that, out came the Day of Judgment. Finn then totally lost it because he was like, I've been dealing with this for seven years. It's been like a seven years itch. And now I'm going to turn that into making you my seven year bitch. Now look, that is one of the most ridiculous lines that has been said in WWE in ages. But he delivered it with so much fire. I was like, yeah, <laughs> you get that seven year bitch and give it an itch. By this point, Dom Dom, Rhea Ripley and Damian Priest were all off the apron, which is when Seth Rollins tried to get the jump on them. Which again is two plus two equals potato because he got absolutely murked here. I was like, man, that guy's done. And he even got smacked in the head with the briefcase when Sami Zayn came out with a chair. But he sucked as much as Riddle did earlier, because even though he got a few shots away, eventually the numbers game caught up with him too, and he was killed dead. Seth then really got it because he was hit with the razor's edge, the frog splash, and the coupe de gras, which meant Raw ended with the Judgment Day standing tall. And again, if you want to call them the Bloodline Phase 2, you totally should. I love the fact that WWE has invested so much time in them. They are flubbing great. So was this. I'm ready for that match. Getting it up. For all the crazies too, no, I don't think it's silly that Damian Priest didn't cash in. Because him and Finn Balor literally had a conversation a couple of weeks ago where Priest was like, all right, for the good of the group, I'll let you have first dibs. Now, of course, he could go back on this, but they did have that chat. It is part of the story. Everyone's moaning online. You can't do that when WWE has addressed it. Now, of course, at times they do deserve to go, what are you doing? This is not one of those occasions. 
done. Which did bring us to the end of Monday Night Raw, and it's going to get an up. I am so damn excited for SummerSlam, and that's because everything at the top of the card, right down to the opening matches, feels like it's had investment put into it. Round of applause. I'm having a great wrestling time. Now, please do leave a comment below and let me know what you thought about last night's episode of Raw. Click the ups and downs videos on the screen right now, which will be for AEW Collision, and we can have some fun there. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. WhatCulture.com, social media, Simon316, and WhatCulture, WWE. But otherwise, put a smile on your face, attack the day with joy, and I'll see you soon.